I'm going to talk to you about reviving 1980s supercomputers uh, and doing it at home. Now, to be completely fair, my home is an old farmhouse that has three-phase power going into it, which helps a little bit if you try to do this kind of thing. Um, so here we go. Um, I've been collecting computers uh, since about as long as I can remember. Uh, started as a little kid and to me for a long time this has sort of been and still is the holy grail of collecting computers. This is a Cray 1. Um, this particular one is located in Germany in the Deutsche Museum and um, the closest I ever got to collecting one is this which is the logic module from a Cray 1. Uh, this I get to touch, uh, that one is behind glass. Um, so what you're looking at here is, is the Cray 1. It was developed in 1976 and um, delivers 160 megaflops peak performance, uh, delivers about 110 megaflops on a Linpack benchmark. Um, until the Cray XMP hit the market, uh, this was the fastest computer in the world. Um, implemented in CMOS ECL, uh, all these little logic chips on the board. There were thousands of them in the machine. And um, they consumed about 115 kilowatts of power. So the machine had to be cooled using Freon. Um, it weighed about 11,000 pounds and came at a price tag of 9 million US dollars back in 1976. So, quite a special machine. So, I have a website for my collection and for a long time I've had a wish list on there and the very first thing on the list is anything supercomputer-ish, Cray, Convex, CDC, Alliant, SGI Challenge, something like that. So, my friends know this, some of my friends know this, so all of a sudden I get an email from a friend of mine saying, have you seen this? Supercomputer, starting bid, 300 US dollars, uh, local pickup only on the west coast of the US. <laughs> and what you're looking at here, this is about all the information I had, there wasn't any more in the ad, but it looks like there's two convex C1s in here uh, and an I.O. cabinet. So I figured I'm not going to be able to decide within a few days whether it's economically feasible for me to hire someone to go there and pick it up and ship it, but I don't want this system to get destroyed. So I sent the guy who was selling it an email saying if it doesn't sell, please let me know. I'm really seriously considering trying to acquire it. I just can't put a plan together in two days. Um, so when the auction was over, I got an email from the guy and um, no one had bid on it. And I was the only one who had contacted him about the system. And he was really uh, glad that anyone had replied at all because he really wanted this to go to a good home. And he basically said, if you can arrange shipping and all that, you can have the system for free because I'm not really after the money. Um, this guy is an 88-year-old um, professor um, who used this in his um, home. He was basically developing code and supercomputer manufacturers were interested in getting his code running as fast as possible on their computers. And the founder of Convex, Steve Wallach, was smart enough to realize that if he gave this professor one of their computers, he would start developing on it and they would get an optimized version for free. So um, Convex was founded in 1982 by Bob Pollock and Steve Wallach and basically they wanted to fill the gap between the VAX and the Cray, between the super mini and the supercomputer. So they called this a mini supercomputer to confuse terminology even further. Um, they had a mission statement, built the fastest machine possible under $1 million. Uh, their first product was the C1, which was a, a vector machine that further developed into the C2 and later the C3. And after the C3, they started working on a multiprocessor system built around PA wrist processors the convex SPP, the exemplar, 
Um, then Convex got acquired by HP, and this further developed into the SNX class machines, which then beget the Superdome. So a little bit of, super, of Convex legacy is still alive and well at Hewlett Packard. Um, so the Convex C1 specifically. Um, it was finished in 1984. I think the first one is sold in 1985. It's a single CPU vector processor and it's implementing using um, gate arrays in CMOS TTL technology. So no fancy ECL logic there. This is, fair, this is not um, the very top end of state of the art. It's just a, a tier below that because if you go to the very top end, you're not going to stay within the $1 million budget. Um, it can handle up to 180, 28 megabytes of main memory, and it costs only one-tenth of the price of the Cray-1. Um, for that price, it delivers about one-sixth of the vector performance of the Cray-1. Um, fortunately for Convex, the Cray-1 was not a very well-balanced machine. Its non-vector or scalar performance was considerably worse than its vector performance. And because a real-world problem cannot be completely vectorized in general, you have always have bits of code that can't run in parallel and that are just a single stream of execution. So Convex basically developed a machine that was much better balanced. So on a typical real-world problem, it would reach to about a third to a fourth of the performance of the Cray-1. So for a company looking to buy a supercomputer, getting something that delivered one-third to one-quarter of the power at one-tenth the price and one-fortieth of the power consumption was a pretty good deal. And all this fit into two 19-inch rack, total weight of about a thousand pounds, including all the I.O. So um, then I got another email from the guy while we were talking about this. And he said, by the way, I have also have an Intel and an Ardent, which I acquired through similar deals with vendors. So these were given to him as well for using his home office. Um, so the Ardent Titan was built in 1988. Uh, it can have up to four vector CPUs. Um, it's the first supercomputer basically that has a graphics card built into it. It used to be if you wanted to do visualization, you'd run the calculations on the supercomputer write it to a tape, carry the tape over to a workstation, read the tape, and then you could visualize it. This took away the carrying around of tape or the scurrying of data over a network. Um, mine has a single CPU, and it's about as fast, uh, a little slower than the Convex C1. Um, I'm not going to cover all the information on the slides because we don't have the time for it, unfortunately. Um, the other thing in the, uh, that was in there was the Intel IPSC. That was a very early multiprocessor system from 1990 um, with, with up to 128 CPUs. Um, theoretically a very fast machine, but it didn't scale very well. Um, so the real world performance and even the performance on a simple benchmark stayed far behind its theoretical peak performance as you can see. 5.1 gigaflops peak, but even on a very simple impact benchmark, they could only realize about 200 megaflops. Um, so it takes a while to get things organized. Uh, I saw the eBay advert when I was here last year for the boot camp, and finally in December we managed to put everything together, and the shipping company showed up and took the systems away on the west coast of the US, drove it to their facility, and this is how they created everything up in some custom-built wooden crates. And then you figure they ship it in December, it will get here somewhere in January. I had to be a bit more patient than that. Um, Christmas came a little late for me, but finally in March, here are the supercomputers sitting in our driveway. Um, so then you get to unpack and figure out what state are these machines in. And unfortunately, there were a few problems. The Ardent, 
All the hardware seems to check out. I can run some diagnostics from the firmware. Unfortunately, there is no hard disk and no operating system. So it's kind of like a boat anchor at this point. <laughs> I could, I might, if I had the documentation. Um, the Intel, also the hardware seems to check out, but without the special front end, you need to control the machine. It's not really going anywhere. Kind of another boat anchor. Um, the Convex C1XL has some power supply issues and it has been Basically, what happened is it failed and Convex rolled in the other machine, the C1 XP, replaced some boards in the XP with boards from the XL. So between the two systems, I might be able to get one of them working. Um, so this is the Convex C1 uh, after I've bolted the two cabinets back together again, the way they're supposed to be. So on the left, you've got the CPU. On the top right, you've got the tape drive. And below that, there are supposed to be some really big 8-inch or even 14-inch hard disks. I say supposed to be. They're not there, unfortunately. Um, so I figured with this machine, I might be able to use a bit of help and maybe find some documentation, things like that. So I found a website, xconvex.org. Um, ex-convex employees tend to refer to themselves as ex-cons, <laughs> um, but their mailing list is called ex-convex. So while I didn't get onto the mailing set list itself, I found someone who was willing to act as an intermediary between me and the, media and the mailing list, and that way I got in touch with a number of ex-convex engineers who were very happy to see someone take on the task of bringing one back to life. So the very first thing I had to do was check out all the power supplies. And in the bottom of the CPU cabinet, there are three large power supplies. Um, each power supply delivers about 1,000 watts or um, 200 amperes at 5 volts for the logic. Um, and the one in the middle wasn't working. Now, fortunately, there was one spare part shipped with all these computers, and that was a spare replacement for that power supply. So um, the one that's shown here is actually, it's got a slightly different color from the other power supplies, as you can see. That's a replacement. And um, that worked. I had to replace um, uh, a few bits and, bits and pieces uh, in the power control system that basically turns all these power supplies on in the correct order. But after that, I had stable power. Um, I took a multimeter, and it gave me exactly 5 volts. I took an oscilloscope, and there wasn't too much ripple. Hooray. Good. Um, so the next thing, there's a small hard disk in this machine that contains the Unix for the service processor. And there's one thing about hard disks. If you get a hard disk that's 30 or even 40 years old and has been sitting still for 20 or 30 years, it may work, it may not, but even if it does work, it may work today and it may fail tomorrow. So I tend to prefer to try to take it out of the system first and hook it up to a machine where I can make a backup copy. So I took it out and um, this is a fairly early SCSI 1 disk. Um, it's actually got a serial number of 17. So. Apparently, this came from one of Convex's prototypes, and it's had some quirks. Uh, it's not really compliant with SCSI 2. It's certainly not compliant with SCSI 2. It's not even compliant with the SCSI 1 standard. It's m sort of like a hybrid between SASI and SCSI, which meant my normal SCSI controller couldn't deal with it. Um, so I had to revert to the use of a protocol analyzer for the SCSI bus to basically read the data on this disk over a serial port in hexadecimal. <laughs> um, and then I couldn't read all the sectors, but the second time I tried some of the sectors I couldn't read, I could read them. So I ended up writing a little C program that talked to the SCSI bus analyzer, and over something like 72 runs, I managed to read the entire disk. Uh, took about 14 days, I think. <laughs> um, so after that, uh, no, they didn't. <laughs> um, so I wrote the image to an old uh, DEC RZ25 disk, which has the jumper to switch between SCSI 2 and SCSI 1 mode. 
jumpered it for SCSI 1 mode and put it into the convex and try to boot it. So what happens? You type boot at the prompt and it boots. Now this is just with one board in the machine. There's one card in the machine that's basically a computer in itself. And it's a service processor that is ultimately responsible for running diagnostics and booting the real Unix on the vector processor. So this is what that boot looks like. Um, file system checks. And then it tells you the software that's supposed to be installed on the real hard disk. And there's some initialization of the scan rings, which is the main diagnostic facility on this machine. So about one third of all the logic in this machine is dedicated to diagnostics. So you can figure out what is broken if something breaks. And so, and, and so the computer even knows it's broken. Otherwise, you'd just be getting the wrong results of your calculations without any indication that anything's wrong. So the next step, gradually add all of these boards that make up the vector processor and the main memory into the machine. So all the boards here that say MAU are memory, uh, memory array unit. And the other six boards or eight boards down there are all uh, are the single vector processor. So then you run some diagnostics. There's basically a set of diagnostics for every component in the machine, for every board in the machine. So the service processor diagnostics run fine. The memory diagnostics, I had some problems. I had to exchange some of the memory chips on some of the boards. Um, in the middle of all that, um, I had some, some other interesting bits and pieces. I needed to replace some memory chips. I had to swap some boards with the other machine. But finally, I managed to get to running the CPU 4040 test, which is basically where the vector processor starts doing all sorts of things at the same time in different orders. And this is a test that takes about six hours to complete. But finally, I got a passing score on all the diagnostics in the machine. So. The interesting thing about these machines is that there's a Unix um, a kernel image that lives on the small SPU hard disk for the main processor. So when this machine boots, it begins booting from the small, uh, from the small um, hard disk that the service processor uses, and then it tries to mount the real file system through another disk controller and from a big Fujitsu Eagle 14-inch uh, hard disk. Now, the 14-inch hard disk is missing, but I could at least try to boot this kernel. So I ran the MNT OS boot command, and the first thing it does, it is initializes, uh, well, it, it first checks uh, the clock speed and it checks the voltages of the power supplies. It then initializes main memory, and after memory initialization, it goes and uh, basically loads the VM Unix file. It announces itself as convex Unix version 7.1. Um, and then it goes looking for devices, and it panics because it cannot find the root device. So I was playing around with things, and all of a sudden, there's a big, loud bang. <laughs> And my lab fills with smoke fairly quickly. And fortunately, I have these red mushroom buttons on the wall. So I hit it immediately. And I'm thinking, what's the damage? Did the, did the chips literally get blown off the boards? I mean, if you deliver 600 amperes at 5 volts and you get a short somewhere on one of these boards, there's a good amount of damage that can be done before the breaker trips. Um, so fortunately, the, all the, visual, the only visual damage appeared to be in one of these power supplies. This is one of the big electrolytic capacitors, and it just exploded. Um, it's a smell that you recognize. Um, so I sort of lost confidence in these very old power supplies. Um, so I replaced all three of them with pretty much brand new power supplies, which I happen to have lying around from another project that I never finished. Um, I actually got these at a clearance uh, sale at an uh, electronics store that went out of business. These power supplies are normally around $1,200 a piece. Uh, I bought a stack of 10 of them, and I think I paid 200 bucks for it. Um, so 
amazingly, after replacing the power supplies, it still worked as well as it did before the power supply blew up. So I quite like that. So then a little later in May this year, all of a sudden I get an email from Germany from a fellow computer collector who was very much into convex and who heard about my adventures. And um, he basically said, well, I have two convex machines that I picked up years ago around the time they were going out of service. And um, I would not mind recuperating the space they're taking up in my storage unit. Um, so we had a bit of a chat back and forth. And a few weeks later, this happened. I had to enlist the, list, uh, the help of a local farmer to actually get it in the door. Um, but over the course of two different um, weekends, stuff started arriving. Um, yeah, I have a very uh, patient wife, <laughs> fortunately. So um, these are convex C2 machines. They are slightly later. They were built in, uh, well, they were developed in 1988. That was when they were released. Um, they're downwards compatible with the C1. So all the code that runs on the C1 runs on this too. Um, and they take up to four vector processors where each vector processor is also a bit more powerful than the ones in the C1. Um, this uses ECL, um, so this is a fairly power-hungry technology, um, but they still manage to keep it as an air-cooled system rather than liquid-cooled, which would have driven up the cost. So this can take up to 512 megabytes of main memory. Later they increased that to two gigabyte with newer memory modules. And this system, um, the, the, there are two systems that I got. One is a two processor C220, the other one is a two process or a quad processor C240. And the C220 gets close to the performance of the Cray 1. The C240 um, is about double the performance of the Cray 1. Um, of course, at the time, the Cray 1 was no longer the fastest machine on the planet, that was the Cray XMP. So this delivered about a fifth of the XMP at an eighth of the price and a seventh of the power budget. So the deal was not as good as the C1 compared to the Cray 1, um, but still sweet enough that this was Convex's best selling system um, of the, all the, um, the C series. Um, the CPU cabinet is a bit bigger on the dual CPU machine, it's 30 inches wide, and on the quad CPU, it's 60 inches wide. Um, the I.O. racks are 19 inches, and the CPUs are a bit heavy. They're 400 and 800 pound cabinets. Um, so, of course, I couldn't resist the urge to line them all up in a very pretty fashion and take a selfie. Um, <laughs> So there's the dual CPU machine, which I'm holding. Here on the left in the front is the quad CPU C240. And then there are nine IOS cabinets that came with them. Um, there were also three pallets filled with spare parts. Um, on the left, you see disks. On the right, you see mostly power supplies. And in the bottom, you see boards. Um, there was documentation about 500 volumes about 300 unique volumes. I have some duplicates if anyone is interested. Um, and then there were disks. There were a total of 48 disks, a mixture of five and a quarter and eight inch disks. Uh, most of them were three gigabytes in size, which in 1988 was a decent amount of disk space. Um, so this is the C240 CPU cabinet with the doors open. So the red and the, green and the green bits are the CPUs. So one CPU consists of six boards, and you can see some metal blocks over the front of the uh, four rightmost boards. Those are connectors. They couldn't fit all the signals on the back plane, so they had some connectors in the front of the boards. And then the white part is the memory. There are eight memory boards of 64 megabytes each in there, so 512 megs. And then um, there are some uh, yellow labeled cards that form the utility subsystem uh, that mainly contains the referenced and modified bits that are used for memory management. 
Um, on the far right of the machine, there are blue and white shaded areas. Those are for I.O. So here is an overview which I took from one of those documents of the architecture. So on the left, you have the four CPUs, vector control, vector data. It, you see the six boards that make up a single CPU. And then here you have all the memory, and every memory has five ports going into it. So on each memory board is basically a big crossbar switch that allows simultaneous access to that memory board from five different sources, as long as they don't reference the same bank at the same time. So four ports for the CPUs, one port for the I.O. subsystem, and then the I.O. subsystem, you basically have a peripheral interface adapter which um, has a bus that is the same bus as the one that was used in the Convex C1. And that way they could reuse the I.O. boards from the Convex C1. So there's basically two types of boards that I have in my system as far as I.O. goes. There are IDCs, integrated disk controllers. And each integrated disk controller has four IPI interfaces on it. Each interface takes up to eight of those three gigabyte disks. And then there are VIOPs, VME, VME bus IO processors that each connect to two VME buses where you can have network cards, SCSI controllers, also other types of disk controllers, things like that. Um, and then at the bottom here, you've got that CPU, the, the CPU utility subsystem and the service processor. So if you take a look at one of these boards, that makes up the processor, there are six boards somewhat similar to this one in each processor. And the boards are 20 by 20 inches, roughly in size. Um, so this is the scalar function unit. So any non-vector processing happens on this board. And if I zoom in a little bit, you can see the different pieces of technology that were used. There's a little bit of TTL logic implemented in those 100 kilo gate arrays. The density of ECL logic doesn't allow gates that large yet back then. And um, so the vector part of the processor is mostly done in TTL logic. Mostly everything else is done in ECL logic except for the floating point part of the scalar function unit, which is uh, what is visible in this picture. Now, because you have TTL, which has logic levels, zero volts and five, five volts, and you have mix that with ECL where a zero is minus 1.7 volts and a one is minus 3.1 volts, you need level translators. So those are these chips here. And um, so, so for anyone familiar with electronics, this is a regular 14 pin dip package. So you can see that the ECL chips are a bit bigger than that. And the main reason for that, they're also ceramic, is that the ceramic functions as a heat sink. Um, there are ECL logic arrays made by Fujitsu on the right side here. Um, ECL logic signals need to be terminated. So these machines have a separate power supply that delivers 800 amperes at minus two volts just for the ECL signal uh, termination. And all these little yellow packages are the terminator resistor networks. And then another thing they used were ECL PALs, which are programmable array logic, where you can basically add, uh, you, you basically program a, um, a, a, a sum of products function into those chips. And this was a bit of a gamble because when they started designing the machine, they figured they were going to need a whole lot of them. Um, but the technology wasn't quite ready yet and the manufacturers were still struggling on how to make them. And in the end, it all worked out. Um, so if you look at the, the C220, the smaller of the two machines, there are about 17,000 chips in that machine. Uh, and a lot of them are, 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 are these ECL chips. Um, the largest number, of course, are the memory chips. Um, the 512 megabytes of memory are implemented using over 5,000 one megabit memory chips. Um, so, okay, this is what I got. What, were, what was the state when I got it? The C240 is complete. All the boards are there. 
but some of the cables have been cut and it's very dusty. Uh, it's got four CPUs, 512 megabytes, so it's fully populated. Um, four integrated disk controllers, so this system could have up to 128 of those three gigabyte drives. And two VME bus I.O. processors. The C220 is clean, there's very little dust there. Um, but one of the vector data path boards has been taken out. So there's one complete processor and one incomplete processor. And I reckon that when this system was decommissioned, some system manager just really liked to hang one of those boards on its wall, which is what typically uses. Um, it's got two of the integrated disk controllers. It's got two real-time I.O. processors, which are almost the same as the VME bus I.O. processors. They just have much lower interrupt latency, and they were typically used for real-time applications with special interfaces. So based on how clean it was and the fact that it fit my power budget at home, I decided to get to work on the C220 and leave the C240 for now. So first step, get SPU Unix running. Same as on the C1, check the power supplies. So there's 1600 amps at minus 4.5 volts for the ECL logic. There's 800 amps at minus 2 volts for the termination of the ECL signals. And there's 400 amps at plus 5 volts for the TTL logic and memory in this machine. Uh, and then there's just small change at minus 5, plus 12, and minus 12 volts. But that's nothing to write home about. So after I checked all the power supplies and it all turned out to be all right, I plugged in a minimum board set to run SPU Unix and managed to pass the diagnostics for it. Hooray. So then you plug in more boards. So I plugged in the boards for um, CPU A. I plugged in two of the memory boards, which is the Mimnal configuration because you need to install them in pairs. And then the machine didn't boot anymore. Um, turned out that between the first time I powered it on and when I tried to power it on here a few days later, the hard disk for SPU Unix in this machine had actually died. Fortunately, the very first thing I did, as I always do, is make a backup copy. So I wrote another copy of it to a different disk, put it in, and start it over. So we passed the diagnostics for all those boards, um, ran the memory diagnostics, find out that there was one memory board that had a problem in the uh, crossbar switch, took that out, replaced it with one of the spare boards. Um, I ran the diagnostics again, um, found out that it passed all the diagnostics up to the point where the CPU started talking to it. And then I found out that the CPU, the vector CPU was not initializing properly. And I was beginning to get somewhat worried because um, I had the diagnostics manual and what it was basically telling me is I've got a problem either on the ASP board or on the CPX board. The ASP board is part of the vector processor. Um, it's the um, addressing board. The CPX board is the CPU utility board, and I only had one of those for the C220. Um, so if that was indeed the problem, I would not be able to get this machine running um, without board level repairs, which are really, really difficult to do if you don't have the full schematics. Um, and also, if it's a machine that uses ECL logic, that's not commonly available anymore. So um, on a whim, I sort of decided I'm going to try to move the CPU from the CPU A slots to the CPU B slots and see what happens. Turned out that that took care of the problem. Um, later, when I started reading some more of the documentation that I hadn't started reading initially, I found out that if a machine was configured with a single CPU, the CPU was supposed to go into the CPU B slot. Mystery solved. So ran the memory di diagnostics again, replaced some memory disks, and then I managed to pass all the CPU and memory diagnostics on this machine. So I now have a machine that's basically all the logic checks out. It passes all the necessary diagnostics. Um, there was a small fix I did in the meantime because every time I booted the machine, I had to enter the date and time because it thought it was the 1st of January 1970. 
Um, I got kind of tired of that, so I replaced a, a little battery in there, and the battery it needed was no longer available, so I basically hacked something together with a, with a coin cell. Uh, worked fine. Um, I can't set it to 2017 because there are no Y2K patches for this machine. <laughs> but um, so now you want to try and boot Convex OS, which is the later name for Convex Unix. So on the SPU disk, there is a file that is used during initialization that describes the I.O. configuration of the system. That told me that I had to look for a five and a quarter inch disk that it booted from and that it would have had, originally would have had a device address DU0. Fortunately, some of the disks I had were labeled. And there was in fact, a, all the five and a quarter inch disks I had were labeled and one of them was labeled DU0. So I found it, um, I basically plugged in all the I.O. bits and pieces to add the VIOP and the integrated disk controller. And um, I managed to boot basically on the first try. Now, what I didn't like about it was that I have no other machine that can take IPI interface disks. So basically, this is it. There's no way I can make a backup of this disk other than using the convex itself for that. Um, so what I did is I looked on the root partition for the uh, Etsy FS tab file, which describes where all the file systems are mounted, and found out that all the file systems were in fact mounted, mounted under a directory called cache. And this system was basically used as a big uh, tape backup server and with a staging area consisting of 72, terabyte, uh, 72 gigabytes of disk space. What that meant was that all those other five and a quarter inch disks I had contained nothing that could possibly be of any use for me. So what I did is I took four of those disks and I just created backup copies of the system disk onto four more disks, put two of them in secure storage and two of them remain in the machine. Um, during the middle of one of these copies, the machine just went down all of a sudden and wouldn't power up again. Um, it was complaining on the front panel about the minus 4.5 volts being out of tolerance. And out of tolerance was a bit, turned out to be a bit of an understatement because it was in fact delivering zero volts. <laughs> um, to make a long story short, and you can read the whole story on my website, but basically, the output on one of the four parallel power supplies had developed a short. And it was basically dragging everything down. I took that power supply out and replaced it with one of the spares, and the machine came alive again. Um, these systems were built with a certain amount of resiliency built into the power subsystem because that was the most frequent thing to fail. And the power supplies are cheap, power control logic is cheap, the CPU boards are not. So um, the CPU boards are very well protected from errors in the power supplies. Um, so I wanted to get networking going so I could copy some of the data to my NFS file server um, just so I could study what was on these disks without having to have this 12 kilowatt monster running all the time. Um, so I played a little with, with the uh, jumper settings on the uh, network card, configured networking, and then I used tar to copy everything that was on the system disk to my NFS server, and it was very slow. I could not saturate even the 10 megabit network card that was in the system. Um, in fact, I was only transferring about three kilo, uh, 30 kilobytes per second, um, which was painful. Um, and I had 43 gigabyte disks that I wanted to take copies of to figure out if there's something useful on there before they break. Um, so I decided to go a slightly different route. Um, so what I did is I used the DD command to basically make an image of each disk on my NFS server. So I hooked up a few disks to the convex, boot the convex, and then run DD on each of those disks, copying it to my NFS share. Um, this took about one hour per disk, which means that for all those disks, this took about um, a work week. 
uh, which meant the system got a really nice workout, um, during which one more power supply failed, which I subsequently replaced and just kept going. Um, this power supply, by the way, we placed in a way that didn't bring the machine down. So that was pretty nice. There was just a warning, this power supply is bad, I've switched it off, you might consider replacing it. Um, so now I have disk images sitting on my server, and I wrote a few little simple utilities in C to do something useful with them. So first I wrote a little utility that went looking for super blocks on the boundaries of um, partitions to basically figure out which of these partitions contain data. Then I wrote a second utility that took one of these file system images created by that first utility and basically extracted an entire file system form from it. Then I found out that there were in fact uh, stripe sets in use where uh, one file system is spread over multiple disks with 46 kilobytes on this disk, 46 kilobytes on the next. Um, so I write, wrote a couple of utilities to deal with those and figure out how those stripe sets were put together, go looking for backup copies of super blocks on a pool of disk images to figure out which one I needed, because most of these disks were not labeled. To make a long story short, I was able to get most of the file systems of this disk and basically get useful data of them. So what did I found, find? Um, I found system disks for four more convex systems. The, two, the C240 I have, another C240 and two C3800 series systems. I found the Fortran compiler, a ton of Fortran libraries, and some really interesting um, software for electronic simulation, neural network simulation, um, aerospace engineering, weather prediction, um, and tons and tons and tons of user data from universities and research facilities, and even from the Dutch convex office, which was surprising. Um, while you're playing with it, you can run the uh, syspic command, which will give you something that looks remarkably like monitor on VMS. <laughs> there are a lot more VMS-like things about this machine, because VMS was an important system at the time. Um, you can read some of that on my website. Um, Fortran, I had a bit of trouble getting a Fortran compiler going on this machine, because the Fortran compilers are tied to the serial number of the machine, and there's an activation code embedded in this uh, in the machine. To make a long short story short, I had to change my machine's serial number by wire, by removing and adding some wire wrapping on the back plane, and then I could install a Fortran compiler from this tape. Um, I've got three minutes, so I'm speeding up a little bit. I've got a few more things to do. I want to get FDDI networking going. I've got FDDI network interfaces on the convex. I want to build a small router so I can get uh, 100 megabit network speeds out of the system rather than the pitiful 10 megabit. Um, I want to hook it up to a period accurate visualization workstation. Um, and I've received a couple of packages while I was in the office this week that might help me get the C1 going again um, to wit full logic diagrams and a set of backup tapes that were taken from a C1. Um, this is what the system looks like now. You see the I.O. cabinet on the right with a tape drive, uh, VMEBA chassis, and eight of the three gigabyte disks. Um, to put it into perspective, this laptop delivers about 16 gigaflops on a simple Limpack benchmark. The exact same code would require, to get that level of performance, you would need 145 Cray ones which together would consume 17 megawatts of power. <laughs> and as you see, even with the uh, convexes, you'd still need between two and three megawatts of power to deliver the processing power this laptop delivers on a battery. Um, so no, there's no commercial use for these. People have been asking me, are you going to keep them running 24 seven and rent out computer time? No. <laughs> um, if you're curious about any other aspects of these systems or any other things in my collection, go to www.vexbarn.com. If you find something in your attic or in your barn that you think might be useful for a starting computer museum, 
just contact me at my VMS uh, email address. And with that, it's one minute to one, uh, which means there is no time for questions. But if you come see me in the hallway, I'm, I will gladly answer any and all questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you.